roots of psychiatry have to do with control, power, and alienation from certain groups of people who were uncomfortable to be around. They were locked up in these places to get them out of the way. Uh, the history of psychiatry, I think, really is related to institutions. Bethlehem Royal Hospital in London was one of the world's first psychiatric institutions. Commonly referred to as Bedlam, the hospital was little more than a warehouse for those deemed mad. Inmates were confined to cages, closets, and animal stalls, chained to walls, and flogged, while the asylum charged admission for public viewings. In the 18th century, William Batty was the first to promote that his institutions could cure the mentally ill. Batty's madhouses made him one of the richest men in England, though his treatments were every bit as inhumane as those practiced in Bedlam, with not a single patient cured. His financial success triggered a boom in the asylum business and an opportunity for psychiatrists to cash in on this new growth industry. This was an era where, on both sides of the Atlantic, specialized institutions for the mentally ill are beginning to be built in large numbers. Those institutions date back certainly to the beginning of the 18th century, and in a few cases even earlier than that. Uh, but the explosive growth of an asylum sector, of asylumdom, as some historians have called it, is very much a, a 19th century phenomenon. Uh, it's that period when the state is persuaded to invest tax dollars in building these places. But while those who ran the institutions were getting rich, psychiatrists yet lacked the credibility to maximize their cash flow. In order to justify their profession, they needed to come up with these biological solutions, or they didn't, didn't have any profession. The only way for them to solve that was to attempt to start uh, believing that that these people that were suffering from emotional disorders was from, from a biological basis. Whatever was done to make this person more manageable would be simply called a treatment. And the sad reality is that many of these so-called treatments were in essence torture. The near drowning devices that were developed in this period, for example, must have been appallingly frightening. For example, one device involved putting the patient into a coffin, closing the lid, and dumping it into a bath of water, and then opening it up and trying to revive the patient. But there were a range of these things, and the mortality rate was, was very, very high. Psychiatrists next sought to give credence to their practices by cloaking them in the language of medicine. This repackaging of treatment became known as the medical model. Somebody who's really hyper and manic, uh, if you're wrapped up in a cold sheet and dunked into some water, you're going to quit acting manic because that's a punishing uh, treatment. So, but as soon as the symptoms started to go away, they started to believe that somehow by wrapping them up and dunking them in cold water, it was um, draining the toxics out of their body. So they built the medical model around that. Pushing the biological theory of mental illness a step further, an American, Benjamin Rush, put forth the idea that insanity was caused by too much blood in the head. The cure? Remove the blood by any means possible. Restraint, cold water, bleeding, even terror. And with that, a new medical model was created. Benjamin Rush was probably the most famous American physician of the revolutionary era. Uh, Rush was known as the master bleeder. He bled his patients for madness. He also invented something called the tranquilizer. It's a chair that looks a little bit like an electric chair. The patient was confined in this apparatus, uh, sometimes with cold water applied to his or her head, for some hours at a time. And Rush announces in a letter that he's invented this new contraption and dubbed it the tranquilizer. Rush's often lethal procedures were detailed in his 1812 textbook, which remained psychiatry's authoritative source for the next 70 years. He was so revered that in 1965, Rush was enshrined as the father of American psychiatry on the seal of the American Psychiatric Association.
As the 1800s wore on, psychiatry's mounting failures at curing madness threatened their financial bottom line, forcing them to invent new medical models. The cures promised when it was delivered. So by the 1860s and 70s, a growing mood of pessimism was covering Europe and North America, that effectively the new institutions were ever growing in size, but not growing in their effectiveness. The 20th century brought more medical models. American psychiatrist Henry Cotton mutilated his patients by removing their body parts, declaring this a breakthrough in the treatment of mental illness. The earliest target was the teeth and then the tonsils and the sinuses, but when patients didn't get better, the enthusiasts for this treatment then started to move down the body and to say, well, obviously patients have swallowed um, bacteria in their saliva, so stomachs need to go, spleens need to go, uh, colons need to go. As public outcry escalated over torture and maiming of patients, psychiatrists would invent new methods, each one hailed as the miracle cure. But each one was ultimately proven no more effective nor less brutal than the last. This is a history of psychiatry, more or less, to, to damage the patient. I mean, this is a version of the original model, which was to chain them like animals. If you're doing it to somebody because you insist that they have to change, and you're going to do that by turning the screws, you might say, whether it's with medication, restraint, whatever, that's torture. And a huge part of what psychiatry has done really comes down to torture. As the 20th century progressed, psychiatry would continue to seek legitimacy by transforming itself into a medical discipline. But they succeeded only in creating more efficient ways of inflicting mental and physical torture and death, a legacy that has carried forward into modern psychiatry with its most profitable medical model to date, the mass drugging of millions. But to do this, psychiatrists first had to shatter one of mankind's most cherished beliefs, decreeing that people were not what they thought they were. Leipzig University, Germany, 1879. Professor Wilhelm Wundt experiments on the human senses. Wundt declares man's thoughts, personality, and behavior are nothing more than chemical reactions in the brain. Wundt uh, became frustrated with his inability to change behavior because he was dealing with the original, you know, psychology. That's the psyche, that's the soul. He created a new science which was based on man being an animal without a soul to be trained not to be a thinker but to be trained students from around the world gathered to study Wundt's new definition of man as a soulless organism the spirit of the age was summed up by German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche God is taught God bleibt taught Und wir haben ihn getötet. Following Wundt's theory, a Russian, Ivan Pavlov, conducted animal experiments seeking methods to modify behavior. Pavlov studied with Wilhelm Wundt in Leipzig, Germany, in the late 1800s. And he experimented with uh, dogs with electrodes and, and stimulus response, denying uh, privileges to denying rewards. And he noticed that when he brought out some food in front of animals, dogs in particular, that they would begin to salivate. So he'd ring the bell at the same time that he brought the food out, and then eventually, instead of bringing the food out, he just rang the bell, and of course the, the dogs got all excited. He called that a conditioned reflex. Pavlov's first human subjects were children. He punched holes in their cheeks to collect and measure their saliva. Pavlovian conditioning became one of the major foundations of a lot of behavioral science research in the 20th century. 
The idea that behavior could be controlled through repetitive conditioning became known as behaviorism. The behaviorists believed that all children are animals and can be trained as animals. This was the view of, of behaviorists. As a matter of fact, John Watson, the, the most famous of the uh, behaviorists, says that you have to treat human beings or look at human beings the way you would look at the ox you slaughter. See, the behavior is not interested in what's up in your head or your soul because they don't believe there is a soul. Watson's successor, Harvard psychologist B.F. Skinner, believed all behavior could be manipulated to suit whatever ends the behavioral psychologist was seeking. Skinner developed what's called operant conditioning, where he um, was able to demonstrate you can change animal behavior by certain schedules of reinforcement, by giving them rewards at certain times, and then you can teach pigeons to play ping pong, for example, and you can teach rats to run mazes and you can teach human beings to seek certain economic or societal rewards. Skinner could actually shape new behavior patterns and this actually was the sort of thing he quite soon became very famous for. Perhaps his most notorious experiment was the Skinner box. He was uh, designing a Skinner box which was something like a big plate pan. Uh, but everything in its control, the temperature's controlled, the light's controlled and, and so on. And the idea is that you uh, present children with certain stimuli that you want them to learn to react to. For nearly a year, Skinner isolated his daughter in a box similar to those he built for rats. The child was stimulated and had to respond in a certain way like, like, an, like a chicken or a rat in a cage. Because they firmly believe that children are animals. If you believe, though, that a, a child is a human being, you can't train him like a rat. Today, about $40 million a year in taxpayer money is paid out by the United States National Institute of Mental Health for behavioral psychology research. A total of $19 billion for all research since 1948. With these funds, psychiatrists apply the same conditioning techniques developed by Pavlov, Watson, and Skinner. Case in point, a juvenile detention center where children are hooked up to batteries delivering peak values of up to 270 volts and shocked in a procedure called aversion therapy. Antoine was having a number of problems because he was up at a center that was shocking him every time he did anything. There was a button on a little, almost like a TV remote that would be used and pushed. They will get an additional shock for trying to remove the electrode. So they are, they're expected to sit there and let this pa electricity pass through their skin without trying to remove it. If they yell in anticipation of the shock, they will shock the student an additional time for yell. The cost to, to send a student to George Rottenberg from New York is about 214000 per student. These students are tortured. They're given this electric shock therapy for no other reason but to inflict pain. Other techniques include administering electric shock to treat sexual deviance, sending powerful magnetic impulses through the skull to interrupt brain activity, and shooting high voltage through surgically implanted electrodes, all to stifle problem behavior and costing up to $100,000 per patient. And while this science without a soul led to behavior modification techniques that continue to generate billions in research and treatment, it also laid the groundwork for another psychiatric movement that would cause the deaths of millions.